mind while I show you some of my ideas. Um, I call this uh, presentation the FAP4 teacher education metaphors we teach by because the field of teacher education is a relatively recent one, whereas other sciences and other humanities have a long-standing tr tradition of centuries of development. Ours didn't start until the 19th century uh, in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, it was much later, right? And somehow, a century and 20 years is not a long time for a profession to be consolidated, right? So the situation we have nowadays is pretty much like this. Uh, how do we become a teacher of teachers? And I would like to stray away from other terminology and pick up this terminology by Malderes and Wedell, uh, who call teacher educators or teacher trainers, teacher of teachers. Karen Johnson says the teachers are learners of teaching, so I like this teacher of teachers or taught more than teacher educator or teacher trainer, which may have different connotations. The truth is that around the world, the way one becomes a teacher of teachers depends on the context in which one is. Basically, if we think about why we become taught or teacher of teachers, well, some of us may have experienced it as a promotion. We were a master teacher or a teacher in an institution, and we were promoted as a sign of recognition for our service to the profession. At other times, we are willing to be professionally engaged. So we start by giving short workshops or seminars or making presentations in conferences. And there, because you are helping other teachers develop, you become a teacher educator. Sometimes there are institutional needs. Your institution needs somebody who can provide in-house ongoing professional development to their peers, and you are spotted as the person to be able to do that. Other venues into teaching teachers is doing postgraduate work. Something I do not quite agree with uh, in the current situation where we see many people who do their BA, immediately they engage in their MA, and immediately they do their PhDs or MDs, and then they become teacher educators in graduate schools. And what happens there is there's not a significant amount of involvement in the practical side. And we're going to see how this has consequences to how we do our task. <clears throat> the, sometimes there are changes in institutional roles. As organizations develop, and the topic of professional development becomes a pressing one for many people, particularly in the context we are now, where we, are, we need to grapple with new technology, we need to find new and alternative ways to actually promote learning in students. You may veer from being just a teacher to being a teacher who helps other teachers, even if temporarily. Others... We have, some of us may have a vocation for this, and we prepare ourselves to become teachers of teachers. Uh, it's the same way as other colleagues become administrators, and other colleagues choose to stay in the classroom and become excellent teachers. And many times, and this was at least particularly my case, because there was no one else. Looking around, you couldn't find a teacher educator, a teacher of teachers, and you have been called in into the role. Well, that is quite a daunting experience. And I am, I'm sure that many of us can relate to this uh, problem, where all of a sudden we are thrown in at the deep end, and we have to do something for which we have not been prepared. We have been prepared to be language teachers, not necessarily teachers of teachers. And there's a difference between being an excellent language teaching teacher, sorry, who knows a lot of uh, different frameworks for teaching, and then being somebody who mediates or supports the professional development of a colleague. It's two different kinds of learning. And when we come to that position, how do we get there? Well, 
The first thing is we get there with baggage. Whenever we become a teacher educator, we bring with us everything that we have done in the classroom so far. And that baggage stays with us. We don't take it away. We, it's like our go-to survival kit whenever we find a difficult situation teaching teachers. We also have our own learning biographies. Not just learning the language, how did we learn English that we now teach, but also how we were as students. All those little things, like whether you misbehaved in the class or whether you were a really studious student, whether you uh, were creative or dedicated, all those things would impinge on the way, the style of teacher, teaching teachers that you choose. There's also your experience as a teacher itself, who has given you a thorough background on what works and what doesn't in the particular context of the schools where you work, which is not necessarily the context of the schools where your student teachers are going to learn. That baggage also includes theory, right? And there are two kinds of theories that we espouse. First, we can talk about public theories, the ones we get through our training, <coughs> pardon me, our education. This is the theory that we get from books, the theory that we are taught when we go to university or to teacher training. So we have that, which is one of the points of the compass that we use. But then we also have private theories. Theories that come from our learning biographies and experience that help us survive in the classroom. So we know what works. I'm, I'm putting inverted commas here. And what doesn't work. Some of those theories are implicit. That is to say, we do things guided by certain principles, but we are not aware that we are doing that. Others are explicit. We can say, explain how we do something. And if you've ever found yourself in a position of having to explain why you do something in a certain way, you can see the tension very clearly between implicit and explicit here. Then <clears throat> we have histories. There's a wonderful concept in social cultural theory called the funds of knowledge. And that is all the edu informal education that you get from the moment you're born and you bring with you because your family brought you up in a certain way. Those histories also impinge on what you value at the moment of teaching. And this applies not just for teaching teachers, but also teaching the language. So this has to do with beliefs. This has to do with values. And this has to do with predispositions. Are we prepared to share or are we there to show our expertise or are we there to uh, provide a service? All those things come from your history, your funds of knowledge, uh, and they are derived from your family upbringing. We also come with ways of doing. Each of us develops our own way of doing things. Why? Because we may learn a lot of theory, we have a lot of experience in the classroom, we may have many different experiences, and what happens is we find a comfort zone. This comfort zone is the place where we teach knowing that what we are doing is good, that the students are learning, and that we are getting our results, the results that we expect. Now, those ways of doing may become fossilized after a while. And we tend to repeat them over and over again. And they remain unquestioned until we become reflective teachers of teachers. When you are thrown in at the deep end, in general, you don't have time to engage in reflection. It's more of a reactive role, that the one that you have. So we can say that we come to teaching teachers in default. We bring the default settings, if you wish, and part of the computer metaphor here, um, of what happened to us as a teacher educator. So in the same way 
that we tend to replicate the ways we were taught, we tend to replicate the ways we were trained or educated as a teacher. That is what I say, that we come with ghosts behind the blackboard. And who are those ghosts? The people we admire, the professors, the teachers, the students who made a significant contribution to a moment in our professional development, the ones who helped us become better at what we were doing. All these things um, contribute to what supposedly should be the knowledge base of teaching. There have been many um, studies on the knowledge base of teaching. What do teachers need to know? And there's extensive bibliography on this. But I want to go back to what originated this uh, knowledge that we now have, we now have about what teachers are supposed to know. And that is the work of Lee Schulman uh, at Michigan State University back in the 80s. What Lee Schulman did was to look at the sources of teacher knowledge. <clears throat> and he came up with this wonderfully simplistic, though very complex framework what is the teacher need to know their subject teachers need to know the context in which they teach they need to and they also need to know the pedagogy but if you take each of those separately each of those kinds of knowledge separately you are not really a teacher Say you have always been in love with the language or languages and you love to learn languages and you think you like to teach languages. So you get to a moment where you have developed full proficiency in a certain language and you want to study more. But what happens is there are no more opportunities for advanced language work. What you have is teaching well. If that is your case, the specialist you don't teach. Okay. Helping other people grow, helping other people succeed, and you need to just to engage and you like to plan and organize activities where people in again, maybe your knowledge of what you are teaching is not that good. If you are just concerned about the pedagogy, then you're a pedagogue, but you're not a teacher. And if you're more concerned with making a difference in your students' lives or contributing to your society in the belief that education is the only way out of poverty and the only way of liberating people who are somehow oppressed, then you are not a teacher either. You are just a social activist. What a teacher does is the three roles through a particular kind of knowledge that Lee Schumann called pedagogical content knowledge. Pedagogical content knowledge is a synthesis of all those other knowledges, which implies that a teacher knows how to teach a certain content to a certain group of students at a particular time using particular methods that are effective. That pedagogical content knowledge is not developed overnight. And guess what? We cannot teach you pedagogical content knowledge. We cannot write about pedagogical content knowledge because it is a synthesis of three things <clears throat> that Malderes and Wedell called knowing about, that is the theory, then knowing how, those are the techniques. But there's one kind of knowledge that is only derived from the experiences of applying knowing about and knowing how in the classroom. And that is knowing too. Many times uh, I get asked, what is knowing too? Isn't it knowing how? And it's not, it's more intuitive. It's a kind of knowledge that is the residue of having done something professionally. This, as I said, my there is and I have all my references in the last uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. So when we are thinking about becoming a teacher of teachers, we have to position ourselves and actually think, do we know about 
the language, the methodology for, the, for teaching the language, the social contexts in which the language is taught, do I have experiences that I can resort to, the knowing to, <coughs> pardon me, mm -hmm. to be able to inform my practice. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. people have reacted differently mm -hmm. to what a teacher needs to know. And particularly when we think of traditions in teacher education, we must think about the genesis of teacher education as a field, as I said before. Teacher education became, um, was born when formal schooling was founded. Now we have to remember why formal schooling was found. Uh, there were factories in what was then the developed world. Uh, with many, many workers. He was found out that children were being abused because they were being forced to work. But they needed an institution that would keep the, the, the kids busy while their parents work, when they stopped working in factories. So they created a school using the same factory model. There was one supervisor, many different workers, one teacher, many different students. And then what were these students taught? They were taught basically the survival skills, reading, writing, and numeracy. That's it, nothing else. Then, with the things that happened over the late 19th century and 20th century, we saw a progression of ideas in terms of teacher education. But I want to address four traditions today, three of which are long standing and one which has recently come to our attention. And when I say recently, I'm talking about the past 20 years, even though the seeds for that new perspective or tradition were planted in the early 20th century. It was, well, I, I will explain that later. So what does a tradition include? The different traditions I'm going to share with you all have a professional name. They are known as something else. I call them traditions because like any tradition, they are things that we do because they have been done before. Not only do they have a professional name, they clearly specify a role for the teacher of teachers and a role for the student teachers or trainee. They conceive of knowledge as stemming mostly from certain sources. This tradition has a very clear goal for the education of teachers, what kind of teachers they want to produce, let's say. They have expected outcomes. So the goals are what the teacher uh, of teachers need to teach. The expected outcomes are what the student teachers need to learn. They're, they have particular orientations to teaching the teachers. There are particular techniques, activities, or practices which are associated with this tradition. Those orientations come from sources of training. And in general, we can say they oscillate between theoretical positions and practical positions. So what I'm going to do now is to show you three traditions, which I call look and learn, read and learn, and think and learn. And then what I'm going to do is introduce a fourth tradition, or something which I hope will become a tradition, and show you how you can do it in the classroom. And I have chosen an online teacher education unit because of the situation in which we are in. I hope this is something that you can find, uh, you can relate to at this moment. So let's start with the read and learn tradition, the look and learn tradition, sorry. <clears throat> what do we know it? We know it as a craft tradition. Teaching teachers is a craft, it's an art. And how do you do it? Well, basically, the, the teacher of teachers is the expert, the role model. And if you want to become a teacher of teachers, you have to emulate that person. The, the, the teacher, the student teacher, the trainee, 
is seen as an apprentice who practices a craft. And this is the old apprenticeship model from the Middle Ages, where the craftsperson was the one who had all the knowledge, the apprentice was the one who had no knowledge whatsoever, and the master slowly brought the apprentice into the craft, giving them small, very small responsibilities in a cumulative manner. So the knowledge base of this look and learn tradition is that knowledge about teaching is a fixed body, a fixed set of techniques or methods or approaches that have worked over time. And because of that, you, you need to know how to practice those things. So training in this way, and this is training, is pretty much using very short courses, like one month or one semester courses, where you are given an induction into teaching through what? Through techniques. There's a lot of standardization in this, uh, in this approach, because the goal is to learn prescribed practices so that everybody knows the same and does the same. And those of you who have gone through those standardized international teaching qualifications that are taught in short periods of time, you know that you are taught one way of calling students' attention, like raising your hand and putting your finger to your mouth. You know that there's a way to use the board, there's a way to ask questions. What you are doing is replicating a model. And even though it may be reductionist. It makes sense. If you are an accrediting body, an international accrediting body, and you are trying to standardize the same quality, you will require this kind of standardization. Now, the outcome of this perspective is that people are able to do teaching. That is why you have one month of training, intensive training, and then you go on into the classroom. I have a friend in the States who also, I always ask like, well, but what do you, what's the difference between a certificate in teaching, a diploma in teaching, and a master's in teaching? And she once said something very interesting. She said, well, if you have a certificate in teaching, that means you can manage one lesson. You can plan it, you can implement it, you can reflect on it. When you have a diploma in teaching, that means an extended, uh, a more extended period of study, you can manage a course. You can see how one class fits into the other. You can plan the schedule. And when you do advanced study, you can actually create courses and classes. That's her opinion. Uh, I don't share it 100%, but I think it's a good way of explaining this. Then what's the orientation to teacher education here? Well. We need to get everybody to use the same methods, the same procedures, which are anchored in tradition. The tradition is generally what works in one place. So why change it if it ain't broken, does the saying goes. And the sources for this training are standardized sets of methods, techniques, and materials. So no, no matter where in the world you take these courses, you always learn exactly the same thing irrespective of the context. And then, in terms of the theory of uh, practice violence, here the priority is practice. You do it. Once you learn to do it, you may question it, but it's not important why you do it. The important thing is that you do it well. In contrast to this tradition, there is... The because of universities, which have not the uh, practices of ways of writing. <clears throat> so what do we call the high science or academic, academicist tradition, where the role of the select the correct uh, bibliography based on research, and the all-knowing master who can only that person can evaluate the performance of the student teachers. And student teachers are seen as readers and appliers of theory. So you read a lot of theories, research, 
you discuss it in class, and then you have to go and do it. And you have to be right. faithful to that theory. But the knowledge base is, again, a fixed body of knowledge which stems from theoretical research, right? Uh -huh. Theoretical or empirical, because there's some research that has to do with what happens in the classroom. But that research is not decided by the teacher in the classroom. In general, it's the, um, the project initiated by uh, an academic somebody who teaches in the classroom. The goal is that uh, their candidates have their knowledge of theory so that they can do good practice. Because the only practice that this tradition recognizes is the practice which is based on theory of this perspective is that people should know about teaching. So there's a lot of coursework involved. There's a lot of reading, okay. summarizing, okay. of critically okay. appraising, of doing literature reviews. And then the orientation to uh, teaching teachers is ways of teaching prescribed by theory. I'm not saying or oriented by theory, I say prescribed by theory, because if you think uh, the rules. The source for training is research, is research literature in applied linguistics, in psychology and pedagogy. Huh, there's no theory based on classroom research, initiated by teachers about their students and what they do every day. So the emphasis here is necessarily on theory, theory before practice. Well, this is true and it's alive and, and living in many parts of the world. In the I think I learned. And thanks to the work of Nation and Reflecting Practitioner, <coughs> Reflection was born. For the first time, we had something that brought together theory and practice in teacher education. So the teacher of this is a facilitator, a model of professional reasoning. Mm -hmm. So what you do is a
to share our reflection with others. So what we need is a perspective, a, a fourth perspective the, or tradition that allows well, us to idea. actually move on in a direction which is more principled, uh, more aligned with what we consider learning to be. And this is where this tradition, which I call participate and learn, takes flight. It's known as the social cultural turn in teacher education and work on the social cultural turn began in the late 1990s and early 2000s. It's based on the work of Lev Vygotsky and his followers, but there's a lot of influence in terms of other theoreticians like Jerome Bruner, David Osubel, <coughs> Um, uh, constructivist like that. In this perspective, the teacher of teachers mm -hmm. is considered an old timer in a community. E teacher education or teacher te teachers is seen as an activity that creates a community. In the teaching of teachers, community. So he or she stands to learn from interaction with the community and is a mediator of learner, whereas the trainee are co learners of teaching. And they are legitimate community members because even if they are not fully uh, qualified, part of the activities of in this tradition is much richer. It's a combination of professional knowledge that comes from the theories, from the experiences, from everything we bring to the table, even our funds of knowledge, that is the personal knowledge. But when people interact, we all know that new knowledge is developed and that knowledge is validated by the community. Hence, we add to the equation community knowledge. And when we are all learning something, we are all experimenting both the teacher educator and the student teachers. So there's doing to make lives interesting for teachers to produce it. Collective the goal as a production. If I, I have more resources, to fluctuation internet, the fluctuation of our binula. You man, you coast there, not you get a ramjila coast can say you. Modila post can say you in body and never in big rega. Sala here, Tamigo, all it in you, Afi has got only caricam here. Tony by the knee. And security issues out of an era, I mean, double militia, Gore, Argo Thomas to Io and Eravan. To Nancy party when your son gets her here. Bonda Baku, which I am. Of course. The stem from what we can call situated personal and collective mediated experiences of the community. So it's composed of what one person in the community has learned, who has shared with others in terms of the reflection in, in terms of the results of the actions taken by community members. It's knowledge that is socialized, so it becomes collective, and it is mediated by an expert or I don't like to call them experts, but a more knowledgeable other, as you would call it, right? And it focuses on the experience of the community. So it's very contextual. Here, to me, the end goal of this, uh, the balance between theory and practice, is that this perspective or this tradition allows us to do two things. In fact, theory. Costu fluctuation by the Hazan connection at least of the owner of the military. Tangler 
कनेक्टिंग मन चाहे बीच आ रहा हूँ यार अब यो आज यो सॉकी है सी जूम को पासवर्ड चेंज करने पर हो सर जूम को पासवर्ड चेंज करी आना पर मलियार चेंज करने अली अली अब कार्यक्रम थे कि बंद हो उनसे फिर इधर पैटी बंद होला वन डॉर बार हो मलते यार नवे मलियार बहुत चेंज करने दे जूम को पासवर्ड चेंज करने पर नहीं हाँ अब कोटी मिनट सर सवा जो अली कोटी बेस समय रहेस को हाँ छह सात ब Thank you so much बनो तेरे कुछ नॉलेज अब तो तेरे इंटरनल इश्यू और इश्यू आवाज़ ने चेक भी ना बनो ताकि तेरे इन करते ना सही सर आ तर 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 तो मो आर को बड़ा साइन इन कर चुके मेरे बड़ा है ना तो मेरे को तो तर कस्टो भाई बने इश्यू आए हुए यार है तेरे इस तो इश्यू आऊँ सर साथी वाला बंदा है वो बंदा न अब मैं पासवर्ड अल चेंज कर सक सर समस्या तो तो पो यहाँ चाहिए है अब नए पासवर्ड मैं यहाँ चेंज कर दें अब इस तरह जो क्वेश्चन धेरे इंटरटेन नगर क्या तब फर्स्ट सिक्युरिटी रिजन्स अब कहीं भी भन्न पेन तो वैसे बे मैं विभिन्न अर्थ को अनर्थ ला तो कहीं नगर् ते पड़ी तब को चाहिए द ओनली सर्ट बिकज अफ टाइमिंग्स वी आर रनिंग आउट अफ टाइम भन्द सक क्या हाई अब मैं हे अब भैन भैन के मरण मेरे तो खुलते खोलने सर्वर डाउन मैं ताम लाने बेला फिर ये समस्या होता मैं तो अर्क वेबसाइट पर फिर लिंक बिर्स समस्या ये छाने यार कह समझ लिंक तो हाई एक्चुअली हे नई कई भाई मैं कल कर सकद सहयोग कर अब तो भैन के मरू तो यार हाँ लस हस हस पोस्ट मैं चाहिए teaching <clears throat> but also they will take the same charts for class observation and they will discuss the cooperating with the cooperating teacher the reasons for management classroom management problems how to create successful classroom and different interactions now here it's theory loaded and then after they do that i need to get them to observe right now in our case, it's becoming very difficult at the moment because you don't actually see the students using different patterns physically. But you can do breakout rooms in Zoom, for example, which is one of the, the platforms we use. And then you can actually organize things like this. And it's lovely to see how cooperating teachers and student teachers are working together on this. Now, the observation is a way of bringing the practice to the theory, as you can imagine, because we've read the theory and we understand part of the unit, then we observe. Then we empathize. Look at the task for empathizing. <coughs> I will give you a few minutes to read it. I'm not going to ask you to read myself. But if you can see, <coughs> We are doing a discussion forum where we take one of the patterns of interaction and we explore it a little bit. My purpose here is that they put themselves